So hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Music, Your Future, a really, really important, um, exciting panel, uh, actually an interview with Carter Burwell. Um, so thanks, Carter, for, for joining us. Uh, anyone, who knows much, <laughs> anyone who knows much about composing knows Carter. Uh, most recently, The Morning Show, uh, Tragedy, Macbeth, uh, Tragedy of Macbeth, um, also Three Billboards Outside Ebeling, Missouri, and uh, uh, Carol, and certainly the Coen Brothers work um, with movies like Fargo. Again, thanks for joining us, Carter. Really appreciate it. Oh, good to be here. Yeah. So um, I want to jump right in really quickly and sort of talk about the beginning of your career and certainly understanding not only the creative side, but the business side of composing. So I'm wondering if you can share the sort of quickly a little bit about your music education, your experience, and what you may or may not have learned from the business side in that music education. Well, it's, I guess what I can describe that pretty quickly because I have very minimal music education. I uh, had piano lessons when I was a kid, which I think I stopped by the time I was probably 12 or 13. And then um, later as a um, teenager, started to become interested just in improv on piano. Like if, at what the lessons I'd have were just, you know, the normal piano lessons playing a Bach minuet or whatever. But um, once someone showed me, uh, you know, how to do blues changes on the piano, um, then it actually started to become interesting to me. And it turns out that that's actually making things up is in fact all that's interesting to me uh, in music. I, I, I still don't enjoy, even my own work, I don't enjoy playing. Um, uh, but the creative, what to me is the creative, the compositional part or improvisation part, whatever, you know, is what's interesting to me. Unfortunately, they don't usually give you much of that in elementary school or even high school and you know so anyway I basically just taught myself um so I'm basically self-taught I don't have um any music education to speak of um and um so I you know the business side also you know um basically what I know about it, it just comes from just always asking questions and I do think it's important to you know, never be shy to ask questions from the very first the first film score that I did was for the Coen Brothers um, Blood Simple and um, and Joel and Ethan and I were all complete novices. It was their first film too. And we were just constantly asking, so what kind of, what, you know, we, we made our contract was literally like two paragraphs long and, um, uh, and, you know, we just would put in the, in what was needed, not add anything else. And, um, uh, and I, you know, as it, as things got, as, you know, I matured in the, in the business, of course, contracts got more involved, but I always, I still always read them myself to try to, I'm no lawyer, but um, I'm fairly fearless about just jumping in and trying to understand what's in there. And they are all different. I'd like to point out that even though may, maybe 80%, 90% of any two contracts are the same, there's always some new thing that you have never seen before, um, and you know. So I when I, and when I see those things, I I, I say, what's this? Uh, because you know, a contract is um, a negotiation, right? When someone sends you a contract, like no composers do not usually write their contracts. Basically, someone's going to send it to you. And you're going to look at it, and and um, after you've seen two or three, four, you you get used to what seems fair, what seems unfair. But there will always be some new thing that um, you know you've never heard of, and of course, these days just dis distribution platforms change so quickly that uh, you know I it used to be you know you'd see one a contract and it would say that they have the rights to the music forever in you know until the end of time in the in the known universe. But you know, won't be surprised now if I start to see the multiverse in you know my contracts. It's um, um, there's always some um, something new, but um, uh, but you should never be afraid to ask. And I, even when you're starting out, let's say you don't want to spend thousands of dollars on a lawyer, which I didn't. Um, I actually found someone that I knew from college who had gone to law school and for my blood simple contract, I said, you know, do you think you could, I mean, what needs to be in this? And he literally wrote those two paragraphs and um, um, he, he turned out he, he, he's Bart Walker, who eventually became like a big uh, entertainment industry lawyer, but Back then we were like, you know, 20 somethings. And um, 
you know, you should just always ask, um, ask around, ask anybody that, you know, um, you'll learn something. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like you really did get, you know, a little bit from the beginning, just from sort of a friend or, or somebody you knew um, who maybe was even starting up. So I, I think a lot of times composers don't realize when they think about it, maybe they'll know somebody who's an attorney who maybe even not, you know, who isn't an expert in, in music business, but maybe can provide them a starting point. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's true. And then, the, you know, of course, there's agents and managers, who, again, who um, who see they read contracts to maybe, you know, someone like that. I've also, you know, while we're on that subject, you know, um, lawyers, usually you you pay them by the hour. Agents and managers are usually someone you engage and pay them percentages. But um but a lot of times you'll find an agent who says, well, I am not ready to take you on because you're a beginner and I don't really know, you know, I'm not going to commit to you, but if you want me to look at your contract, I will, I'll take something, you know, um, or I'll even do it for free if they, if they're super nice, but um, you can, a lot of people don't realize that agents will sometimes do just one offs. Um, they'll say, I'm not going to sign you because you don't have enough credits, but I'll, I'll be your agent for this project, you yeah. know, and, and that's part um, of the being fearless, I think, is sort of just kind of working the phones and trying somebody who, or maybe somebody, you know, um, indirectly who might be willing to help you out or, or do a one off. That's right. Exactly. And, um, you know, they, yeah, the agents are looking for composers, just like composers are looking for agents. And uh, so they don't, they don't mind running into someone new and within any agency, there are bear they're the the agents down at the bottom rung of the ladder who are that's how they work their way up as they find yeah. some new person you know so um it is all even though there's a structure in place in the entertainment industry um it is you know you can always i think find somebody who will lend a hand um if you if you're willing to look around and ask. so what are the sort of basics that you look for you know again there's as you said everything is different and there's evolution all the time but if you look at the basics of what you would expect to see in a contract to, you know as you said to be something that's fair to composers what do you expect to see and i think also kind of what's the you know what's sort of the typical deal look like well, so the first thing to know is that um, they're almost all what are called work for hire contracts. So, um, which means that you don't, in the end, actually own the music. Um, there, you know, copyright law says that the moment you've written something, you own it. But um, there is an exception um, in copyright law for what what are called work for hire, um, and uh, that means that if someone's paying you specifically to write this thing, just like if you were you, if you were a scientist working at, at some institution, they, if, they, if you're on their um, salary and you invent some new thing, it belongs to them. It's the same thing if, if you're a composer and you're working for someone who is paying you either as a salary or just a single payment for one project um, and you write something, a tune for them, um, they are going to own it. And um, so you have to accept that that's what you'll see at you. That's pretty much universal as far as I know. Um, and so um, so the, the language will say this is a work for hire and the, the fruits of this contract are going to belong to whoever's hiring you. Um, but they will also um, say that you're going to receive the writer's share of the performance royalties. And um, so that's also completely standard. Um, that's not a special royalty that you negotiate with them. Um, basically, the way it works is that when your music is performed, which again within um, U.S. copyright law means it's um, it's on cable TV or it's on the radio or something. For some reason, we don't playing in a movie theater in the U.S. doesn't count as a performance. Everywhere else in the world, it does. But again, everywhere else in the world, your your music is on that movie will count as a performance. They. Um, money is collected and those are called performance royalties and um, they're collected by what are called PROs, uh, performance royalty organizations. That, and so like in this country, BMI, ASCAP, um, CSAC, uh, there are different PROs in other countries. And, um, and you as the writer are due the writer's part. Um, even if that weren't in the contract, you are due it, but 
that was that in my experience that's always in the contract to just clarify that you get the writer's share of that and normally in the contracts i see mostly the film producers will want the publisher's share so that performance royalty is cut in half half of it goes to the pub music publisher half of it goes to the composer and i've sometimes been able to negotiate to get part of the publisher's share like in a film where they really can't afford me um and I'll they'll say well you can have 50 percent of the publisher share you can have all of the publisher's share mm -hmm. and that way they don't have to pay me cash up front but I know that down the road that's coming to me but regardless of that you should expect to um that the contract will say that you get the writer's share of the um performance royalties and then there are other fine points there's you know you you know there'll be language in there about um record royalties if a soundtrack album is um is made the the language there can be quite odd because it's still basically based as though we were making records um it will and the same with sheet music royalties it's still basically probably the language that they had a hundred years ago um uh, it's talked about 10 cents per you know sheet piece of sheet music for with the ear music on it but um but you know all those things they may be in there they may they may not be but those are things you would expect yeah, to see. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe you can talk a little bit. So you're mentioning performance royalties through, you know, collection through the PROs. Uh, again, interestingly, or maybe frustratingly, um, we don't get any kind of performance royalty in terms of U.S. performances for films. Maybe, you, I mean, do get for in the theater uh, of the right. film. And yeah, I'm good point. Yeah. You do get for cable or you do get for other kinds of airings. So, uh, that's certainly one source of, of revenue income for a composer. Can you talk about the others and then sort of maybe sure. how important different pieces of that pie might be? Sure. Well, of course, another thing that will be in the contract will be how much you're getting paid to write this music. Um, it'll state that it'll state how that's divided up. You should, you should get some bit upfront, like right when the contract is signed, basically. Um, so that, you know, you're not writing, for, with nothing in your pocket you should get something um from the beginning it's either when the contract signed or at the spotting of the film and then the last part of it probably won't come in until they finish mixing the film that's their guarantee that you're gonna you know finish the project um so there's there's that that's your fee um and um you know the fees just you know it's just all over the map i can't there's no number that's impossible to see as a, as as a fee it can go from i mean i guess I've, i haven't done anything for zero in a long time but i um you know i've worked on films in the last like 20 years where it was like five thousand dollars and uh to write you know um 45 minutes of music and that's not much but um but then it also could go up it could be a million dollars you know if you're you know working on a um a feature for a hollywood studio and it's a marvel film you know um um i should also say it's very important to say with regard to fees that um fees are usually divide into one of two categories there's either a straight fee where they're paying you just as a composer and someone they're going to cover all the costs of the recording um whatever those might be and, they, and that means um orchestrators uh conductors musicians studio mixing media um, and all of that stuff so that's one thing and that was the tradition when i started which was like um in the 80s um that was kind of stand that was standard to be fair, I started, I came in through ind independent film. And um, so, it, you know, in the, in the independent film world, they didn't know when, you know, the people I was working with didn't know how to record music or anything like Joel and Ethan Cohen, you know, so um, that was, I was handling all of that. But in Hollywood, um, the standard was that the studio, they have a whole music division. They've got music executives. They even have studios, on, you know, recording studios on their lots. And this standard was they would cover all that stuff and they'd just pay you a fee. Um, so usually it's going to be one of those two things. If you pay for it yourself, you're covering all of that. It's usually called either an all-in deal or a package deal. And so they will give you X dollars and out of that, you have to engage the musicians um, usually through a contractor you have to engage the studio engineers 
you know, orchestrators, yeah. you know, all of it. And um, if you're starting out, you know, that, well, even now at this point, I still like spend a lot of time pouring over spreadsheets, trying to figure out, am I going to, you know, I, I have to make sure that I'm hiring an orchestra that I can afford, that I'm not, that I haven't committed myself to something that somehow the numbers are going to go out of alignment and I'm going to end up, you know, spending more money than I'm making on this. So it puts you in, I mean, if you happen to like this kind of thing, it's it's fine, but you are um, basically doing the job of um, a music executive at, at a studio where you have to estimate what um, what that recording is going to cost. And again, only way, if you haven't done it before, the only way to do that is call around. But again, all these people, um, they're looking for jobs. They're happy to help you make, es they'll make estimates for free. Everyone will estimate, you know, you call, a contractor, they'll walk, they'll work up an estimate for you. You just say, I need string quartet and, uh, you know, piano uh, and, and, um, or you, I need 80 piece or orchestra. And um, same with the studios. They're happy. Everyone wants to help you because they want the business. So they'll, they'll help you with these estimates. But um, if what you were thinking is that you wanted to just be writing music, it is, um, it can be a little frustrating, but uh, in the independent film world or in the streaming film world or in um, if you work for a boutique division of of a Hollywood studio. So that would be like like focus features or well, the way Miramax was when they were part of Disney. I have no idea what Miramax is now if they even exist. But anyway, they all basically they try to offload that work onto you. Um, so you, that's definitely happens a lot. Yeah. But then occasionally you'll come across a studio or even Netflix where um, they do have executives uh, who um, who are handling 100 films and they're um, they'll take it on if you want them to. So it's um that's it varies enormously, but it's important to like when my agent calls me and says someone's offering you this for this film. I have the first question out of my mouth is, is that a fee or is that an all in deal? Because um, if it's a fee, that money is all going in my pocket. And if it's an all in deal, a package deal, then um, it's a more complicated calculation. Yeah. A lot of young composers talk about how uh, frustrating that can be from the standpoint of you want to put, we all want to make our music sound the best that it can. A lot of times that includes live instrumentation to really kind of get the expressiveness you might need, or maybe you start working in a film and you think you can do with a quartet and you realize at some point you need 80 pieces. Uh, have you been in that, uh, either when you were starting out or even more recently, have you been in that kind of situation? What do you do when you recognize that a film requires more than in, that's when it, you know, that it is in the budget? There are a few, I, I'll, you know, I'll expand on that because it's, it's, it's a subtle question. Like There is a sort of built-in conflict of interest there when you, because the fewer musicians you hire going down to zero, the better off you are financially, but that may not be the best thing for the for the music or for the film, and um, and it's, but you are allowed to you know make that call. Sometimes I've seen some contracts where they say, you know, they imply that we're expecting you to hire, you know, sixteen musicians and or or some some number. It's a little weird because it's just like the people writing the contract really have no idea. They're lawyers. They, they, they just don't want you to be cheating them by like, you know, putting all the money in your pocket if, you, if, they, if they're expecting, uh, you know, live musicians. So um, anyway, it is a little bit of a conflict of interest there. And um, some people, like I've talked to Tom Newman about it, he actually lets someone else do all of the hiring and budgeting because he doesn't want that conflict of interest on his in his mind. He wants to know that, the musicians are getting paid properly, that they're, they're, you know, he has the right number of them for the right number of days. And he doesn't want that, that feet to be thinking, well, if I could do this without an oboe and I could do this without, you know, and one and a half days instead of two days, you know, or whatever, that he could save money. Um, personally, I, I do it all myself. And I do, partly because I come from the indie film world, I pride myself on getting the best sound from the smallest number of <laughs> instruments possible. And also because I orchestrate. So I, to me, it's like a, it's a special little challenge that I set myself. I look at what the budget is. I say, okay, it's small, but I think we can do this with 
a double string quartet and a, you know, and some instrument with a lot of color, like, you know, yeah. a clarinet or a, or a, an indigenous, indigenous instrument or some, something, but I, I take it as a personal challenge to try to find a way to, to view the budgets as, as a creative challenge. Um, and, um, and I always use live instruments with one exception, which is the morning show just as much more for the schedule than for the budget. It's actually not a question of the budget. The budget is okay, but I can't deliver an episode a week and like write it and orchestrate it and record it and mix it. I, there's just no way. Um, so that's so far I ha we haven't been doing um, live instruments on, but all my film scores have always had um, real musicians, so to speak. And I, I feel that that, it's important to me for so many reasons. And I'll just, again, I'm, I, I, this is an expansive answer to your question, but, you know, they bring their own humanity. They bring their own, like, decades of training. You know, they bring, um, I always learn something because I also like to conduct. So I'm, I'm standing right in front of them and I can say right then to the clarinet player, is that, is, are we in the best key for you? Is that the best? How's the fingering on that? You know, and talked to the thing I was just recording in London a couple of weeks ago had features harp and I wrote all these harp parts I wasn't totally sure how playable they were but so I can go in there and say to the harp player show me how you're doing this and that's is that hard great it's not hard um I learned so I learned so much um and it's also just a little bit unpredictable right when if I'm have to actually tweaking every little midi you know um every piece of midi data um Okay, that has the benefit that everything's totally predictable. Um, and but I like the unpredictability of working with um, these musicians. They'll always make it sound better, in, in my experience. And um, so um, that's what I what I do. But um, that question of of the budgeting, there's no one answer to it. Like I say, the, and I've I will tell you, I've been hired onto films where I did Sydney, Sydney Lumet's last film, and he told me that. The composer, I was the second composer on it. The first composer, someone that he knew well, that he'd worked with before, and it had been a package deal. And Sydney said to me, I think the guy took the money and ran. He said, I think he didn't hire enough musicians. And I think he, Sydney clearly felt cheated. Um, and you don't want that. I mean, you don't ever want the people who hired you to feel like you cheated them. Right? <laughs> That's the last thing you want. So um, there's that too. You know, you want the director to know that what they're getting and what you're spending the money on is you've really thought about the film and you've really thought about yeah. what it deserves and you're giving it what it deserves and you, um you should you know it's a, always a conversation worth having like before you actually go to the recording and say this is the, these are musicians you've got i think it's going to be fine do you have any questions or anything like that yeah it's great to the idea of bringing directors along obviously also uh as you were sort of intimating each project that you do, the quality of each of those projects, what it adds to the film, that's what helps you get your next gig. So if you are cutting it a little short, that you're really kind of hurting yourself on that. That's right. When we're talking about your music and your future, that's correct. Um, the Every project I get is because of some past project that I did. Um, I've never successfully like this might sound odd, but proactively, I've never gone out and reached out to a director and said, I'm so interested in this project you're doing and, and gotten a job. I've done, I've tried reaching out a couple of times, but nothing's ever come of it. Every, it always works the opposite for me. People come to me because of something they, that I did before. And now I've been doing it long enough that people <laughs> have grown up listening to, um, you know, scores of mine. And, um, and that's how it works is the, you know, the quality of, of the work. And you don't want to shortchange your work. Even if you put aside whether you're shortchanging the director, you don't want to, or yeah. the producer, you, you don't want to shortchange your work either. Yeah. Well, th thanks for the plug on your music, your future. Uh, you know, it's a, a great aside to just say there is a lot of information. It's not all the information you need. As Carter, you were talking about, you really need to be, um, kind of uh, very proactive in getting information, not just kind of going on the information you have, but continue to learn more things all the time, uh, musically from a business perspective. But Your Music, Your Future is all about education. It's all about composers helping other composers 
I, I personally feel, you know, I, I want to uh, make sure that I'm helping others uh, come along as, as I was fortunate enough to be uh, brought along by other folks. Um, I wanted to make us, you know, start to talk about the current state because obviously uh, streaming services are huge. There's much more, uh, uh, many more films or television shows being created by streaming services than really in terms of linear television or other uh, avenues of film, even feature film. Probably more than uh, ever in history, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience on that. Um, uh, how is the process different? How is the, uh, um, the, the compensation different? You know, what sort of things are, you, are in consideration for you that weren't in consideration before, if any? Well, um, you know, I'd never done, uh, for instance, I'd never done episodic TV uh, prior to um, uh, the morning show. So I don't, I can't compare my experience on that to, um, to anything from before. And um, they were, that was one of Apple's, that was when Apple Plus was, Apple TV Plus was just starting. So, it, and it was going to be like their, their, their sort of marquee show. So anyway, that's all to say that they were happy to do whatever uh, to, to make that show um, work well. And, you know, they spent scads of money on the actors and on the production and, the, you know, directors and, they paid me very well, um, and they didn't. There were no um, there were no peculiarities in the contract. It was very, um, very fair. Mm -hmm. um, I know that then I did a subsequent um, season of a show for a different streaming service, and in that case, again, it was not was nothing um, nothing untoward. Uh, but they did say um, that if you will give us your performing rights, we will pay you twice as much um, as a fee. But they didn't like say, you have to give us your performing rights. Um, but I was also aware at that point because I just talked to people in the industry that there were composers who felt like they were being um, forced is probably too strong a word, but they felt like the expectation was that they would get hand over their performing rights um, and um, and that that was part of the contract that they were given. Um, so again, as anyone in the business will tell you, a contract is the beginning of a negotiation. It's not the end of a negotiation, uh, that first contract. Um, but um, yeah, so that was offered as a possibility. And I thought, well, okay, so that's kind of what I've heard about. Of course, I'm not gonna you know, give up my performing rights. Um, we can talk about that late yeah, a little maybe, bit later, but yeah, maybe you can tell a little bit more about why. Why did you make that <laughs> choice? Okay, uh, sure. Compared to other folks, what the choices they may make? Well, okay. So it's for me, it's it's really very simple, but it's simple for me because I've been doing this long enough that I can tell you that um, the the performing rights, which I'm I'm a member of ASCAP, the performing rights uh, um, payments that I get from them, that is what supports me, and that's what um, you know pays for all my family's expenses and our home and you, you name it. Um, after, you know, I've, I've been doing this for, uh, you know, 40 years and it, you know, even though each particular project, if you look at it on a graph of my income from, um, from my PRO, it's like a bump when the film comes out and then maybe some little bump when a cable station starts to show it again or something like that. it's very bumpy, but once you have enough projects out there, all those bumps um, average out into um, what you could almost call a regular income, which, you know, no composer has a regular income, but it's, but it's as close as, as you get. And, um, the fees aren't nearly enough, um, to provide that. And again, they're all completely sporadic, um, and they are one-time things, the fees I get for writing a film. And I never know when the next one's going to come, right? I have no idea. Um, if you have a bunch of series, uh, that you're signed to, that's different. And I, um, and that I know now from doing the morning show that that is almost like a, that's like a regular job. Um, that's actually one of the things I don't like about it. It's kind of like a regular job, but, um, but it can be. And I know a lot of people who, um, who do even more than one series. And that is like having a regular job. I'm a film guy. I prefer to live in 
in uh, that that world for like a few months and then find a new world to live in and um and i just find it more it, it's more of a musical adventure and cinematic adventure for me but um anyway for me the the performance royalties are what support me this there's just no question about it the the fees um don't and that might not be clear at the beginning because your performance royalties are like look like this and your fees are like that but eventually your performance royalties will over the years come up to this and then you know um it's uh i would i would never um give them up because they literally are like you know what supports my family and you know obviously in the u.s uh people have a choice you can take a fee at you know up front and 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 uh give up your performance royalties you can uh insist on you know whether or not you can get them uh the the standard is still very much that you know if you uh request them or even require them or just say look you know it's, it's about fairness uh that um a lot of times even if I, as you said the, you know the first contract is the end of a negotiation um that's a choice as well uh and then obviously there are things uh, around direct licensing which is really not in the scope of of this but is going to be in a future uh interviews which we'll talk more about um where you do own uh rights um which is not typical but but sometimes mm -hmm. it does exist every once in a while so uh, carter um can you uh talk a little bit about you know when you have young composers come to you uh you know if since you went to other people that you knew to gather some information at the beginning what uh, I'm sure it happens at least periodically that someone comes to you. What what would you say the the two or three most important things? I mean, you mentioned a number of things right now, but uh, maybe even so, uh, outside of business or contractual, some things that you might recommend composers think about um, as they're beginning their career and how they can really have a career. It's important to feel like you have your own musical voice. I'm just going to say it right up front, because at you know at a creative level, uh, because once you're in the business, you know you will you know there'll be a lot of people pulling you one way or the other, saying, "Oh, I want a John Williams, you know, sound for this," or you know, Tom Newman or Joel Beckerman sound for this. But you know, it the more that and but the more that you do have your own voice and i think of mine is almost equally film a filmic voice as well as a musical voice the way that i choose to score films um but i think that it's helpful you have you've you know that distinguishes you from the other several hundred people who are out there trying to do the same thing um so i'll say that because i think you could also like you could also take yeah you know, i can easily imagine you could argue the opposite like yeah, you, you, you've got to learn to do everything. Like you, you need to be able to sound like Hans and you need to be sound, able to sound like, you know, Carter, you know, um, but I don't, I don't really agree with that. Maybe if you're looking for a job as an assistant, that that's helpful. But when you're looking for your own work, um, uh, I think it's great to, it's important that people have an idea of what you sound like. Mm. And um, how do people develop that voice, do you think, over time? No. Million dollar question. Isn't a little it? bit of a mystery, I know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, like I say, uh, for me, I think it has as much to do with the way that I see a film as it does music. I see a film and I usually have a feeling, well, this is what I think music could contribute. This is you know, the way I think of it is this is something that's not already there in the film that I think music could contribute and make it a richer, you know, cinematic experience. I, I look for a thing that's not that yeah. not there. And um, my feeling of what that is would be different than another person's feeling. And often it's different than the director's feeling. And then I have to say, I, you know, I realize this might not be what you have in mind, but to just try it out and see yeah. and live with it for, you know, a few days. I've always found uh, that fascinating. It really almost seems like you think of yourself as 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 a filmmaker. Oh, I really yeah. as a collaborative uh, filmmaker in this. And, and if I understand what you're saying correctly, that uh, irrespective of how many oboes you decide to use or pick on an oboes in this. Uh, but irrespective of how many oboes or other instruments you use, uh, that it seems to me the way you're saying it, that your view of the film, your view of the story, your relationship with that director 
is at least part of what makes you special. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I that's absolutely true. I mean, the way I view it, I, my job is half filmmaker, half composer. Um, and in fact, the filmmaker part is the part that, that most of the other people involved care about. Um, you know, the, very rarely does the, you know, sometimes the director will say, that's a nice tune, but mostly they don't, they, they only care what it does to the film. Yeah. And, um, and so I like, I, I'm like to be trying to write good music and, you know, I, that's important to me, but frankly, I'm the only person to whom that's important. And, um, and, uh, the more that you can think about it, your job as being a filmmaker, talk about the film, talk about the drama, the characters, the story, and the cinema. Um, I think the the more you're going to be on the same wavelength with the people that you're working with, many, many directors, producers. Um, yeah, and it, it seems also from what you were saying that it's very much also about tying together the story arc, where there are a lot of times things might be a bit uh, choppy or jumbled and and somehow you're going to make sense of those things. I and mean, nobody likes to be in a position where you, you have to try to fix it, you know, fix it at the end. But uh, can you just talk about your experience about how you tie those different elements of story together? Well, that is, the, it, it's, you know, that is absolutely true that in, the, in reality, we are at the end. And so whatever, you know, they didn't notice in the script or didn't come through in the casting or didn't get caught on the camera um, uh, and couldn't be fixed in the editing does end up um, in our laps. And um, it can just be anything. You can easily imagine uh, that a lot of times it's things like just chemistry between actors, because music does work in an emotional way. Uh, so that if there's an emotion that's not coming through, um, that is, you have to expect that that will always be um, part of our, our job, the emotional, emotionally framing things and frankly manipulating you know the, the audience emotionally um will, will always be part of a composer's job but um yeah there's sometimes you have story elements that are getting lost I, i've worked on films where like the pacing of the you know it's supposed to be an action adventure but the pacing is weirdly slow just because the director just happened to hold these long shots and and the editor couldn't like cut them down or whatever and I'm asked to somehow add, you know, excitement and pace to this perfectly turgid um, film. Um, and, uh, you know, you do your best. Um, I, you know, I'm not great at that. I'd be the first to say. The thing that I personally am good at is um, is finding subtext and finding layers. And, and, uh, and then the thing I'm really particularly, me, I'm really particularly good at is um, sort of dark humor, situations where something horrible is happening but it is for some reason funny and um and of course the coen brothers are um you know excel at that so does martin mcdonough that i've you know, been working with recently and um and i think for some reason i mean that's just my view of life so i am very i um have that natural outlook and um uh you know so yeah when i see um, a two sock sticking up out of a wood chipper. I am, um, you know, with someone's foot in it, I'm, you know, I think hey, that's great. <laughs> Can't wait to score that. Yeah, I don't know um, what happens in your house sometimes, Carter, there must be something <laughs> in your life that uh, brought you to those moments. In, in wrapping up, um, I, I guess my, my main question is uh, now at this point in your career, looking backward, what are the things perhaps that you wish you knew then that you do know now, whether it's artistically or from a business perspective, what are the things that really pop to you right now in terms of thinking, gee, I wish in hindsight I had known X, Y, or Z? Um, well, I think that <laughs> I feel terrible saying this. I don't know if it's good advice or not, but um, I'm a very, collaborative uh person and i when you know directors say things to me i tend to um listen to it and say, and if they say they've i've got i'm yeah i think it should be kind of like this i'll try to help them uh, achieve that vision i think i realize after many years of doing this that maybe i do that too too much and i should be 
maybe I can try that for, you know, um, a few days or a week. But if that's not working, um, I think I should be personally, I wish I had been more, you know, forthright and said, you know, I don't think that's working. I understand what you're saying, but um, I think we're wait I'm going to be wasting time if we keep going down this, this road and kind of try some different things or, um, you know, I think I, you know, the, with the people I work with repeatedly, I, I, it's no problem. I could stand up for myself because we have all that trust. But when you're working with someone for the first time, you don't necessarily have that. And um, and I try to be very, you know, I try to listen to what they've got to say and try to help them make, you know, the movie that they want to make. But sometimes directors don't actually know exactly what they want to make. That's not unheard of. And I think sometimes it is helpful to be, be more of a leader um, than, than a follower. But it's hard to say to someone who's starting out. I mean, I don't know what, you'd have to have a very particular personality. You have yeah. to be Bernard Herman to, to uh, you know, think you knew more than your d director. Well, I mean, to, to your point, though, that's something you can keep in mind and maybe grow into and build into with people that you work with repeatedly. I guess just to go to the extreme, there are a lot of composers that find themselves in a position with a director who might be very prescriptive, where they provi uh, provide temp score. Um, you know, uh, maybe they were a guitar player in, in a, a band at some point um, that you can find uh, somebody who might be very prescriptive. How do you address that? How do you deal with that? So can we talk about temp score for a second? Because, uh, you know, we haven't. And of course it is, it's a thing. And um, uh, you know, I had never heard of it, of course, when I started out, uh, the Coens weren't using it on the you know first few films we worked on. It was only when they finally did a, a bigger budget film, I mean, it's like the fifth film we did, that they, they put a, a temp score in it and um, because they had to do previews. And so basically when a film, there's a couple of reasons why people create temp scores. Temp score means that they, they either the director or the music editor or the film editor has taken music from someplace else, usually from other films, and laid it in um, on the film that you're either going to work on or working on. And there are a couple of reasons for it. I mean, one is, yes, if the if the producers want to uh, preview the film for an audience and you haven't, they haven't recorded the real score yet, or they're trying to figure out what the score is or what kind of film they've got, um, they don't want to preview it without music. Audiences are very uncomfortable seeing, you know, a, film without the emotional information that music brings. So anyway, that's a reason there could be temp score. Sometimes film editors like to cut to music. They, they and a film editor will often um, be putting, basically putting in that temp score. Anyway, you will find, you know, yourself working on a film where there's already music laid in at the point at which you start. And um, it could be, anything right because they they didn't have to pay uh you know for a hundred piece orchestra in order to lay in a piece of music with you know a, you know a piece of music from john williams and the lso so um it may be totally unrealistic right you've got the bu a budget for four musicians and they put um the london symphony orchestra on it but um but even more frustrating i think is yeah the creative um constraint that that presents that I mean that's one you gave other examples of creative constraints but um that would be the first one you'd run into because you you're right there at the spotting session when you're starting to work on the film and for me I feel like this is the opportunity to like imagine some new score or some new music that's never existed and um I'll say maybe some new instrumentation that's never been done and instead of um the blue sky You've got this very concrete thing in front of you and the director will say, oh, I kind of like those bongos or I like the tempo of that. You know, I think that electric guitar is, you know, uh, is great. And so suddenly, instead of like imagining some new thing, you've got this concrete thing in front of you and you're talking about the bongos and you haven't even started writing anything yet. So to me, that's a great shame. And what I try to do, I can't stop them from putting in a temp score, especially if they have previews and things like that but um what i do ask is that maybe you can put make your temp score but maybe when we're spotting could we not be listening to the temp score so that we can unless there's something in there that you just think is the most brilliant thing and, and it's so left field that you know that i should hear it um that's fine or something that's so completely wrong you know that you think is edifying but i really do ask 
please don't play it for me at the start of the project because I want to have the chance to have my own ideas. Um, and of course, it'll be easier for me to say that because of, you know, uh, the films I've done, you know, um, than if you were starting out. But that's the way that I look at it. I try to do that. And the filmmakers that I work with repeatedly, like the Coens, um, but even sometimes filmmakers I work with for the first time, like Spike Jones, he was, you know, he was fun, cool with it. David did a film with David Mamet. He was cool with it. If you explain it from a creative point of view, we're trying to make something creative here. Don't you think, you know, especially these people who are like writer directors, um, they get creativity um, and they can understand that argument, I think. And um, if what you're writing doesn't work, you know, the, you will eventually get the call. Can you listen to the temp on the scene, you know? But um, that's the approach I take. But yeah. to look at it more generally and what you're saying about directors who are very prescriptive, because it's true there are directors who I haven't actually worked with them, but I've I've had meetings with directors where, where they will say, what do you think, D minor and strings? You know, literally, like we're just watching a scene. The director's just showing me a scene that's like our first meeting, and he'll and okay, it was Michael Mann. And and you know, and but that's sort of what he's you know known for. You know, he'll tell the customer how what kind of buttons to use, and it's like you're never going to tell him not to do that he will i know from composers i've talked to that he'll actually book his own recording sessions and he'll like you know he'll just do it and there's nothing that you can do so you know that's kind of you know that from his um reputation going in and there's nothing you can do and it's very frustrating you just have to decide if that's if you're willing to put up with it um i usually take the approach of just smiling politely me you know and maybe making a little note and a little pad so they think so that I, they can register that I, that I've registered their their comment that they want an oboe yeah. you know but um you know the fact is 50 percent of the time they actually don't know what an oboe is um and if you again this goes back to my previous comment if you listen to if you follow their instructions too closely, that's not the way it really works, uh, you know, a collaboration. It's, um, and I've been in a recording session with, uh, with a great director who was saying, oh, we want more boom here, boom. And um, the orchestrator standing next to me says, oh, well, that's easy. And he went out and he like had the, the drums do something, you know. Uh, and that's not what he meant. A half hour later, we figure out it was trumpet. You know, but, um, you know, but what you have to do is when a director tells you something, and even if it's like he's telling you what I want is like angelic strings or I want, you know, boom, what you have to do is think, OK, what is he what's the creative note here? Not what's the he's not an orchestrator. What's the creative note? And I, it's my job to translate that into music. Yeah. So Rather you than know, him, and, trying to tra him or her trying to translate into your language. Yeah, exactly. You really? Yeah. Yeah, you want to find out what what is why are they saying this and um and get to it. And it's just um I always tell directors speak to me like you're speaking to an actor. Like give me what's the scene about, what's yeah. the film about, what's my intention, what am I what are we trying to achieve on an emotional level? And um, you know, and I find that to be the most helpful. Yeah. But yeah, taking it literally yeah. I don't think leads anywhere good. Carter, uh, thank you so much for your time on this. I know that, uh, you know, we've spoken before about this, but I learn something every time and I always find your your point of view on this super interesting. And I know other people will too, both on the creative side and the business side. I think, you know, the, the seamlessness of that, uh, I think is really um, uh, a lot of inspiring, you know, very inspiring, certainly to me and other folks. So Carter Burwell, thank you again so much. Uh, my name is Joel Beckerman. Uh, welcome again to Your Music, Your Future this uh, uh, essentially uh, the beginning of a, a series of programs uh, educating by composers for composers. Again, Carter, thank you so much and uh, appreciate it. It's my pleasure.